Okay. Are you ready, Kat? I am. Should I just... Yeah, on? I would take it away. I think, uh, everyone, this is Catherine Cosburn. I think you know most of us here. And this is her annual research update talk. And I think the plan is that this will last about 30 minutes. Is that right? It should be about 30 Roughly. minutes. And then um, there'll be time for everyone to ask questions, after which the members of her committee will just hang out a little bit and talk with her amongst ourselves. So take it away, Kat. All right. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some work that uh, me and Masumi have been doing with machine learning um, uh, in uh, predicting shallow subsurface density with gravity and muon data. Uh, we're also utilizing some work done by a former undergraduate student, Brady Spears, uh, for his honors thesis. So he's also on the, the ticket here. Um, okay, so that's the title, and we have some particular questions that might arise when reading the title. Uh, the first and foremost is, why are we interested in imaging subsurface density, um, especially at volcanoes? So, um, as you can see here, this is, uh, this is sort of a, a cartoon of what we imagine goes on uh, deep, deep beneath the surface of a volcanic edifice. Um, it's very complicated and um, I'm not going to go into it here because really what we're interested in is this shallow part. So just uh, this part of the edif edifice, uh, but it is just as complicated. You can see here um, beneath a volcano is uh, what's called a magma chamber, and there's a conduit that goes up uh, and causes eruptions uh, sort of at the top of the volcano. This is kind of what we've all, um, when we build a volcano in grade school, this is how we do it. But as you can see here, um, the eruptions don't always occur like that. And um, we need to uh, get a better picture of what goes on underneath these volcanoes, in particular how magma um, and other, hydro, uh, other fluids beneath um, a volcano, how they move and um, where they're located, and uh, that can help us better pinpoint eruptions. And there are several ways to do this. Um, there are many ways to do this. Um, I've sort of broken it up right now into indirect ways and direct ways. So an indirect way would be um, we, we uh, did a study on an indirect way um, last year where we studied the ideal shape of stratovolcanoes and um, what could maybe cause deviations from that shape. And we modeled uh, deviations as elastic dislocations that represent these magma filled fractures uh, beneath the surface of a volcano. And these cause um, elastic response in the host rock, which then causes uplift at the surface. And it's, uh, it's an indirect way of, of getting at um, where, what sorts of of structures are hiding beneath the, a volcanic edifice. Um, on the other hand, there are more direct ways and that's, uh, we come to uh, the topic of this talk, which is imaging with gravity and muons. Um, so far, there have been a few studies that have been done. It's a relatively new field. Um, this group in Japan was sort of the, um, did a pioneering study in a lot of ways uh, where they imaged uh, the Shaoshins and Lava Dome. And they also did, um, so I should mention that um, all of these structures that you see here are static. So they, there's no time dependence, but we can build in time dependence. And this group also has done that um, in imaging. Uh, they take a snapshot in time and time difference, The um, what they see, and they get an idea of how these blobs um, of different densities, how they're changing with time. Um, but for now, we're, we're going to stick to the static problem. Um, another group that has also looked at this static problem is this group in France. And we also did a, a study um, with uh, Los Alamos a few years ago, where we imaged uh, this flat lying structure beneath the town of Los Alamos. Um, and we were able to resolve that structure. So um, the next question that we come to is why gravity and muons? Um, gravity as the 
the geologists and the geophysicists, the geophysicists in the crowd know, um, is a pretty uh, traditional measurement um, to, to make to help image subsurface density. But it's got this well-known non-uniqueness problem. So um, this picture, I think, illustrates it really well, is for each of these density uh, anomalies beneath the surface, so they all have different shapes, they all cause the same uplift, um, or they, sorry, not uplift, um, the same gravity uh, signal at the surface. So we, it really does require uh, some additional constraints in order to, um, in order to back out what the subsurface density might be. Um, muons, on the other hand, so this is a picture of the sensitivities of the gravity measurements and a muographic measurement. Um, the gravity measurement, as we know, it's got that one over R squared relationship. So um, it's got a very broad reaching uh, sensitivity. However, the biographic measurement um, is limited to the acceptance range of the detector. So we know gravity on its own is not good because of this non-uniqueness problem. And muons on their own um, aren't sufficient because of this um, narrow uh, scope that they have. Um, but together, they actually have like a nice complementary um, they have complementary sensitivities. And also, as you'll see in a second, um, they're both linearly proportional they're to density. So um, this is just basically showing how uh, we rewrite Newton's law of gravitation uh, um, in a discretized way. So we've got some discretized domain and the gravity measurements that we get at some gravity station are linearly proportional to density through this uh, GIJ kernel. And that's just given by um, this integral over here. Similarly, um, muon measurements also have a linear relationship to density. So um, over here is, is just a, a nice visual representation of basically what we know is because muons, um, they're produced in the upper atmosphere, they have a well-documented energy spectrum. So depending on the intensity um, that as they hit a muon detector, um, we are able to um, back out how much matter that they've traversed through. And in particular, we're interested in how much um, rock that they've uh, penetrated. And what's nice is that, um, as I said earlier, this energy loss per unit length uh, is linearly proportional to density. And we just write that in this uh, forward calculation here. Okay, so next question. Um, I sort of touched on the current methodology with, I talked about those three studies that were done using gravity and muons for subsurface imaging. Um, those all use beige and joint inversion. And I just wanted to talk just briefly on how those work and what are its limitations with the idea that eventually I want to um, motivate this last question here about why are we using supervised machine learning to address the same problem. So those are these three studies again. Um, they all used a uh, Bayesian joint inversion. And um, basically what we're doing with that is we're taking um, those forward calculations that I just talked about with the gravity and the muons, and we're generating um, a set of predicted observations. And basically what we wanna do is uh, minimize this function here. We want to put in the predicted observations and then minimize um, iteratively the offset between the actual observations and those that we predict. And there's a, a few model parameters like this prior density and a model covariance, which are hyperparameters that need to be tuned. Um, this kind of leads me to uh, the difficulties inherent in inversions. Uh, first and foremost is um, this fact that we need to know a priori information and how best to implement it. So this can be, um, with those model parameters, I was talking about that prior density and that model covariance, uh, we need to have a good guess of what those are generally, um, which requires sometimes a little and sometimes a lot of prior information, depends on the problem. You also need to know how to properly code and optimize a solution, which typically requires um, sort of a deeper knowledge of iterative techniques or more sophisticated numerical methods, um, things that in general, um, 
aren't as accessible to um, to all scientists who are interested in solving these problems. And also, uh, there's that search of the hyperparameters. Okay, so now we come to the um, the the whole. Uh, everything that I've been working on this past year, um, after we finished that other study on the stratovolcano shape, I sort of embarked on this supervised machine learning kick. I jumped on <laughs> onto that train, um, but I just want to talk a little bit first about what exactly machine learning is. Um, but before that, <laughs> I'm going to talk about sort of the idea that we have as far as a proposed user workflow. So I was talking about the limitations um, and difficulties that come with a Bayesian joint inversion and kind of the, the spin that we're trying to go for here is that we want to create um, a much more user friendly workflow for addressing the same problem. And we think that we can do that through machine learning. So it's um, this workflow is kind of broken up into two sets. The first set is this optimization algorithm that Brady Spears developed for his undergraduate honors thesis. And then the second set is our, um, our machine learning workflow. So in this first um, uh, part of the user workflow, we've got, um, we've got uh, Basically, what you can do is choose a volcano of interest. So here we've chosen Augustine because it's a very pretty volcano. Then um, the algorithm goes and extracts the DEM and discretizes the topography. The user then gives it a region of interest. And then um, the algorithm optimizes for muon detector and gravimeter locations. And it's it's nice because it also takes into account um, accessibility. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that's built in where um, if you have knowledge of the road system, you can um, sort of put that into your uh, into the algorithm and it will optimize for that given those constraints. So the next is the machine learning workflow. And um, I'll go over that in a second. But essentially, we're going to generate synthetic data set, train the algorithm. And then finally, the idea is that we will plug in actual data from field observations. So here we've got a gravimeter in the field and a muon detector in the field. And we really want this to be, um, to be user friendly for uh, people working in the field, especially. And, and for their results that they get. So going to that second box, I'm gonna talk a bit about the machine learning workflow. Now in machine learning, it's a slightly different problem than an, inver an inversion. So we're also minimizing the offset between two values, but for this, what we're trying to do is find some pseudo inverse operator which maps um, a set of inputs to outputs. And we're trying to minimize this cost function of their difference. So basically in terms of uh, like a black box picture, we've got inputs, um, the machine learning algorithm learns this inverse operator and we've got these outputs. And you wanna train, in general, you wanna train your machine learning algorithm on many, many of these input output pairs, which um, can be real and that's sort of a data-driven approach or they can be synthetic, which we use in this talk um, because we have knowledge of those forward operators. We have knowledge of the physics um, of our inputs to our outputs. So uh, we've chosen synthetic data. So again, in terms of, um, our problem, we've got some set of our inputs are our set of gravity measurements and range measurements. And our outputs are a suite of models with different density values and patterns. And there is this kind of this pre-processing step. Um, I don't know if that's the right terminology, but uh, use it anyway, where we generate these synthetic inputs based on the forward operations um, from these outputs. So that's how we get our input output pairs. And um, for this talk, uh, basically everything I've, I'll show you has used about a million uh, random perturbation patterns, which we then split 80% um, that we trained the machine learning algorithm, and then we reserve 20% for um, testing it. So it doesn't see this 20% and we can tell how good or bad it's done um, based on how it performs on this test data. 
So basically what we've done is we've turned an inversion problem into a pattern recognition problem. And there are a few steps in this pattern recognition problem, the first of which is um, that we need to discretize our domain. So um, for this, we've taken that study from that group in Japan um, with uh, the Shaoshins and Lava Dome. And we've basically, we've, what we wanted to do is create a toy model essentially, um, well, the kinks from the topography model are getting sort of ironed out. Uh, we can work with this toy model. It's just a Gaussian hill with roughly the same dimensions as this lava dome. Um, uh, yeah, that's basically it as far as the discretization. Uh, the next couple steps in our pattern recognition problem. Uh, the, the second step is then we have to generate those perturbation patterns that it was those outputs that from which we create the inputs. Um, so we have to create these perturbation patterns um, and each perturbation pattern has some discrete density anomaly value relative to a background density. So for example, we could choose a low, medium and high value. We don't really have to know a lot of a priori information. We can if we want to, but a low, medium, high, we have uh, the sort of these values here. And then we generate these perturbation, um, I call them clumps, <laughs> because we want to make sure um, we basically, we've used this Nishiyama paper. Um, so from this group in Japan, um, we've used the size of their, the density anomalies that they ended up imaging in order to sort of give us an idea of how small or how big the density anomalies we would want to be creating are. Um, in general, I think no smaller than 100 meters in the XY direction is, is probably pretty physical. Um, so that's sort of how we've guided this. And so each of these clumps gets a distinct anomaly value. So this one might be minus 500 kilograms per meter cube. This one might be 900. This one might be also 900, that sort of thing. And then again, we uh, generate about a million independent perturbation patterns. So a couple methods that we have tried. Um, the first one uh, was a neural network method using TensorFlow. And um, this is one that was to help me understand, um, well, TensorFlow for one, but also sort of open up the black box of uh, machine learning for myself. Uh, we found that it worked well for two density anomaly values, um, did not work well for three or more. Um, and I think it's just because the algorithm that I developed was not really uh, so robust, but uh, this multi-output classifier algorithm, um, this one is more of a can routine. It is more of a black box. I do understand more or less how it works. So if anybody's interested, we can talk about it later. Um, but the nice thing about it is it's one easier to implement there, implement. there are no hyperparameters to tune, which is, um, you know, if we're trying to make a case about why our machine learning is more beneficial, more user-friendly than an inversion, this is a kind of a big one. And it's also much more accurate on predicting those, de those delta row values um, and not just the outer, um, the outer ones, but also the inner ones as well. But even though this neural network method didn't work um, the way I was expecting, I did get some, some nice stuff out of it. Um, I did notice for a million samples because the memory on a single GPU was too low. Um, I had to, uh, I needed to figure out how to run it on multiple GPUs. And that um, I wrote this quick bite here. If anybody's interested in uh, one, trying out multi-GPU TensorFlow, uh, they can uh, come see, uh, take a look here and work through a little toy problem. Uh, using that toy problem, I, I did some timing on, um, well, one GPU versus two GPUs versus just the CPU. Um, on two GPUs, there is a slight slowdown. I think that's just, there's much more overhead, but again, the whole reason for running on multiple GPUs is um, the memory issue. Uh, but the time on the CPU is uh, about three times faster than on the GPU. So it's really, um, and for those who don't know, Xena has these GPUs. Um, 
we want you to use them. That's what they're there for. Uh, why buy your own if Carsey has the resources? Uh, so that's my little Carsey plug for you guys. But now going on to um, this second method that we tried, uh, this sklearn uh, multi-output classifier. So basically, um, the it does actually work as I guess it's not really a black box, it's a red box. Um, but we've got some inputs, uh, which are the same inputs that I was talking about earlier. It goes through the machine learning algorithm and then the outputs is just we basically taken this target region, our target region is just all the non flat parts of the domain. So basically all of this, this Gaussian hill parts part and we've just taken that 3d structure and strung it out as um, a 1d array and each element in the 1d array gets a number depending on the density anomaly bin so for example where we had the low medium high densities this would be uh one two and three and zero would mean there's no perturbation at that spot and again a little car seat plug um i did have to use the big memory nodes for there uh because a million samples of, is a very large data set, but um, Carsey has those resources, so why not use them? Um, so the results are pretty good. This is, these are results on our test data. Um, I'm not going to go into too much. Basically, what we want to um, to show is that you know sometimes it does miss it, and uh, as you can see, the actual are the blue dots and the predicted are the orange dots. Sometimes it does miss, uh, but overall it does get a general, a generally good idea of some complicated density patterns. So this is all well and good. These are just sort of random perturbation patterns. But we wanted to kind of look at um, something more physical, like something more in the field. Um, so we we started with the effect of adding noise to our gravity and muon data. So not surprisingly, 0% noise, the dots line up with the circles. But 30% noise, um, you can see that it's there's much more. And just as an aside, 30% noise is a lot. Like we would not expect um, that much noise in real data, but we just wanted to um, just I guess, bump it up that high for illustrative purposes. So in order to kind of get a more physical picture of adding noise, what we've done is um, take this, again, go back to this density, uh, this this joint inversion problem that the, the that group in Japan worked on. And we created a, 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 a faux, version of it. So in our Gaussian hill, we tried to recreate these patterns as much as we could and then feed those in as, so we had our test data set and then feed that in as a, um, a an n equals one like extra test data set. So this would be like the example where we would put in some field observations. So uh, with 30% noise, unsurprisingly, it doesn't do a good job at all. That's just way too much noise. At 10% noise, um, it does do better. Uh, we're still missing out on some of this uh, pattern here, but it generally gets all of the locations of, of this, these high ones, these middle ones, and then these low ones. And then unsurprisingly, unsurprisingly at zero point zero percent noise it's the best out of the three and the accuracy is um, about almost 99 percent so it's pretty good so just to kind of summarize um uh, using an inversion versus machine learning sort of the pros and cons of both again inversions require um, much more a priori knowledge for accurate predictions but machine learning we didn't really utilize a whole lot i mean we based the size of our perturbations on that one paper and we also you know chose some reasonable density perturbation values for our delta rho values but it wasn't really um tail it wasn't we didn't have to uh figure out really any, I don't know, it didn't take as much, I think, a prior information. Um, also for the inversion, 
you need the tuning of hyperparameters, but we found with machine learning that um, depending on the algorithm, for example, that sklearn algorithm, uh, it does not require the tuning of hyperparameters. Inversions typically require a little more um, background knowledge on how to um, find solutions, but machine learning, and I'm going to use the term black box in a positive way, uh, which I was told the other day that apparently that's what Google likes to do. So. <laughs> um, uh, we can use it more as a black box, which um, it makes, I think it makes it more accessible to more scientists. And that's sort of the point of uh, what we are trying to do is create that, that pipeline. Um, the problem also with inversion is if we, I didn't talk about this um, in the talk because we, this is part of um, our future work, but for example, if we wanted to incorporate seismic data along with gravity and muons, that inversion is very, very challenging. And um, we anticipate that this it would actually be a pretty straightforward extension of our current work uh, with machine learning. So um, that's kind of exciting. Uh, I think that that's probably going to be where um, this really uh, shows its its superior not superiority but shows its um that's going to be its main advantage um so far the inversion we found is um, more accurate with a higher resolution but we also suggest that the machine learning could be used alongside inversions as a complementary methodology so there's that density prior that inversions require um, that a priori knowledge why not use a machine learning algorithm to get a really good sense of what that um, density prior is? Um, just an idea I had, but um, I don't think that these have to be mutually exclusive uh, methodologies. So future work, um, we're going to uh, actually do the, the, the predictions on the real topography, uh, which should be happening soon. But also, again, like I was talking about earlier, we would really like to incorporate other sorts of disparate data sets. So for, for density imaging, uh, we could use seismic with gravity with muons. And again, it's a difficult inversion problem, much easier with machine learning. Um, we also, I hinted on this earlier, uh, turning uh, static pattern problems into ones with time dependence because ultimately those are more useful for hazard monitoring. Um, this, I mean, we could do something like what the what that group in Japan did, where they time differenced. Um, they took the time difference of different static pictures to get an idea of how um, how those density patterns beneath the surface of the um, they were uh, imaging an actual volcano in that study of the time dependence. Um, so we could do it that way, but also um, I have this internship this summer with Los Alamos. It's a reinforcement learning project, and I think it might lead to some pretty cool ideas on how to do this also. So um, kind of stay tuned. So hopefully that will, um, there'll be more this time next year. <laughs> um, and I guess that is, that is the talk and it was a little under 30 minutes, I guess, but hopefully. Hey, um, so I'm happy to uh, like coordinate questions or Kat, you can, I don't know. There's not that many of us. Yeah, I guess if anyone, they can just unmute themselves. Yeah. Um, I have uh, a comment and a couple of questions, if that's okay. Okay. First of all, thanks for the nice talk. It was enjoyable. Um, we should investigate whether when you're using multiple GPUs, it's doing direct memory transfer or whether it's going through the CPU because that's something you have to enable. Um, and so okay. I think you might get a speed up if we, if we take a look at that. We should at least verify that's what's happening. Okay. Um, I had a question about your noise model. So I, I know you don't have much time, but is this sort of a Gaussian white noise model that you're applying? Or what does 30% mean? Is it signal to noise ratio or what is just- It's just, it's just a, um, a Gaussian white noise that's added. And I take 30% as like a, I, I guess 30% is a little, 
it's like a scaling factor essentially to the Gaussian noise. So is it translate into a standard deviation in your in your noise model? Yeah, or? so I multiple the standard deviation of the data times some random uh, normal distribution and then times the amount of noise. That, that might reduce the signals signal noise ratio. I'm not I, sure. I think you're, you're probably right. Okay. Um, and then so you presented accuracy, which is great, but are you also looking at other metrics like you know, recall and precision and all that good stuff? I looked at the um, the area under the curve for um, a lot of them um, because that gives you a better idea of the the false positives to um, to false negatives to true positives to true negatives. You get a better better picture of that. Um, I was doing that for the machine learning model because it it worked better, but the this SK Learn one didn't have. I haven't figured out how to get that metric for the SK Learn model quite yet. Um, I might just have to plug and chug and do it myself, uh, which okay. I could do. That'll obviously help you find you know pathological cases that might be yeah systematically missed by the machine learning. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, I've got a question. Um, the muon and uh, gravity data, that's all obtained above ground or at ground level, or did you put probes uh, under the surface of the uh, earth? Yeah. So. Um, that's a good question. For uh, these three studies, um, the first two studies, they used muon detectors um, and gravity measurements all on the surface of their, their study region. But our study with Los Alamos over here, we actually utilized um, a tunnel, that, a decommissioned Cold War tunnel that is on their uh, property. And we were able to get gravity and muon measurements from the inside of this the, the mesa. Um, so we were using both surface and subsurface measurements in this study here, but it's not necessary. Um, you don't necessarily need to do it that way in order to still get a picture. How accurate is the gravity data? How, how precise are the measurements? I mean, the measurements we're measuring around 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight uh -huh. seconds squared. So very, very right. tiny. Um, right. And it's all relative gravity measurements. I suppose these techniques can also be used uh, to look for water or oil. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, like and the muon measurements, I mean, the muon techniques are used at the border for um, imaging trucks. So there's Homeland Security. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one aspect of Homeland Security that does make sense. Um, all right, I'll let you go. Um, great talk. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, may I ask a question? Well, first of all, thank you for the great talk. Uh, it's really nice to learn about what you've been doing. Uh, my question has to do with, you know, the architecture of the neural network. And I was wondering whether it is informed in any way by the nature of the measurements. Um, and by nature, I mean, you know, like uh, the spatial structure and the temporal structure of the measurements that you have. I mean, the, the neural network that I found worked the best, even though it didn't work so great, had more of, um, um, so there's maybe 30 gravity measurements and around 1200 muon measurements. So I, the number of inner neurons, I kind of wanted to have this tapering effect. I'm not sure if this is sort of what you're getting at where um, the number of inputs and then the number of outputs I wanted, uh, I chose a power, powers of two. So kind of what was in between the closest power two in between um, uh, the number of outputs. I found this worked the best, uh, but again, it, it 
I needed, if I want to do this, this with the same robustness as this multi output classifier, I need to be a lot more clever. Um, and they already have it. So <laughs> they've experts who have made it. Um, but maybe one day I can try my hand at doing it the way they do it. Yeah, Does thank you. This is, yeah, I was just curious what the structure of neural network was. You sort of flashed this earlier, but you know, I just wanted to yeah. understand a bit more. Thank you. No problem. Let me ask a question. Hi, Kat. Nice to see you. Hi, Michael. Uh, how, how did you decide on how many you try, try different experiments with different numbers of hidden layers in your neural network? And more generally, how did you decide that you, these, this other classifier that you were talking about, wh what led you to this particular design? Oh, this particular design, or why well, did I choose this one over this well, one? Well, both of them, yeah. Um, just a lot of trial and error, essentially. Um, just I, I did a lot of research on different methods that you can uh, use to, you know, reduce your loss and get better. I, I was using area under the curve for um, my metric for this one here. Um, I, I added some regularization, which helped a little bit. Um, I found that two layers was kind of the sweet spot. Three didn't really give me any any improvements, and one was not quite as good. So it was just a lot of like art, art <laughs> artistry, mm -hmm. um, but like a, a, a informed artistry. Like I think there's a lot of stuff out there that. Um, there's a lot of research that's been done that can help guide you, but it doesn't know for sure. Um, and how helpful were the dropouts? It was really helpful because it allowed me to run my um, run for more iterations without uh, with my um, my validation set not uh, without overfitting, essentially, because the regular that's what the regularization helps to do. So I was able to run for longer and get more accurate um, results as a result. Well, thank you for a great talk. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. OK, any further questions from anybody? Well, I have a, a nutty suggestion. <clears throat> um, you know, what you're measuring with gravity uh, is presumably the the derivative of the or the gradient of the gravitational potential. But um, atomic clocks now are so accurate that um, you might be able to measure the potential itself through gravitational time dilation. Um, that's probably wacky. Um, so. Don't spend more than ten minutes on this idea. There, there um, are, there are. I just want to add, it, it's not may not be as wacky as you think. There are people, particularly groups in the UK, that are developing portable um, absolute groove emitters. Yeah. That are um, I don't think they're using time dilation, but uh, it does have some kind of actual. Um, distance, fall distance that they, that things are well, uh, being observed over. So uh, it could be that they're using time. I don't know. I don't know how that works, but I'll find out and, and let you know. <laughs> well, I, rem I remember seeing a demo um, and uh, the, uh, the people moved a, uh, an atomic clock by about a foot and they were able to change, able to measure the change in the in the uh, rate of the clock yes yes um so um that gives you some idea of the accuracy it's uh, one foot and there are five thousand feet in a mile and we're like four thousand miles from the center so that's one part in 20 million i guess or something like that all right anyway i'll stop uh, good talk sounds like um 
a very good thesis and um, the start of a lucrative career. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks for your wacky suggestion. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we need to find out what those guys in the UK are doing. These, yeah, these, uh, yeah that's these, interesting. They're actually quite expensive, these new gravimeters. I, Eric might know who's here, but um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolute gravity. That's a... Yeah, that would be interesting. That would be interesting. All right. Well, um, if folks on the committee could just hang out a little bit, uh, we can... Continue. Thanks.